You can't fly a Spitfire and forget about it. it stays with you forever. It stays with you forever. The Spitfire was just like a dancing fairy. It was gorgeous. I can't really explain it. It was absolutely wonderful. It was childishly simple to fly. Before I could say no, I was up at 8,000 feet in an aircraft that was doing 400 miles an hour. I'd never been in it at that speed, ever. It was the nearest thing to having wings and flying oneself. You only had to blow on the control stick, and it seemed to do what you wanted. It's so beautiful. This is a work of art. But at the same time, you are aware that the purpose of this plane was to shoot and kill. It's a killing machine. If it's a weapon of war, a Spitfire, it's a weapon of war, and you've got to learn how to use it as a weapon of war. Coningsby is home to three squadrons of RAF jet fighters. On the shoulders of these men and women rest the air defense of Great Britain. But it is also home to the most revered fighter aircraft of all time, the Spitfire. And this was the last ever to see service. Few of these famous aircraft have been operated on daily MET flights, helping in the task of weather forecasting. But now, 21 years after the prototype first flew, the last of the Spitfires are to be retired. Their day is done, though three Spits will be kept by the RAF for Battle of Britain flypasts, commemorating the battle they did so much to win. For me, and I think the British people, these aeroplanes represent innovation, ingenuity, determination and an unwillingness to be bullied uh, and really the Spitfire is emblematic of, of that. This, this beautiful machine is our, our Mark 2A Spitfire and um, in my opinion this is the most precious flying machine on the planet bar maybe the Apollo 11 command capsule which brought the boys back from the first trip to the moon or first landing on the moon and the reason I say that is this is the only Spitfire in the world still flying today that actually fought in the Battle of Britain. So it's a truly, truly priceless flying machine 
uh, and it also happens to be one of the most, if not the most beautiful machine uh, that man has ever made, in my opinion. I think for most of the pilots on the flight, this one holds a particular place in their hearts because, of course, we grew up with the legend of the Battle of Britain. People who joined the Royal Air Force, it's part of our core ethos. So to then be able to sit in this machine or to even fly it is an incredible privilege. These are the planes that saved Britain and Europe in its darkest hour. At the height of the Second World War, a film was produced which would forever fix the Spitfire in the public's imagination. First of the few told the story of the famous fighter aircraft and its creator, R.J. Mitchell. What have you been up to? Thinking. Great thought. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Such as? The birds fly a lot better than we do. You don't say. I do. But then they've been at it some millions of years. We've got to learn from them if we ever want to fly properly. The film had a huge impact and turned a weapon of war into an international icon. See how they wheel and bank and glide? Perfect. And all in one. Wings, body, tail, all in one. But you wait. Someday, I'm going to build a plane that'll be just like a bird. Why, it is like a bird. What a strange-looking machine. As a child, for me, running around this place was magical. If we were to come down at the weekend, my father would be doing some particular job on one of the aircraft, I was left to roam. It gave me a great sense of what these aircraft were about, even at an early age. So looking at what it means to aviation and what it means to the story of the Spitfire, this aircraft, the Supermarine S6, I think it's the most important aircraft we've got here. What gets me is it's so narrow. Even after all this time, I've known the aircraft for so long, it's so narrow. Well, you appreciate, of course, that they, they, they went in sideways and then turned around, so they got their shoulders under the combing here, head back on here, and a very thin cushion to sit on. So M248 was built for the Schneider Trophy contest in 1929. The Schneider Trophy was a race for seaplanes, it started before the First World War as a fairly small event in Monaco. By 1931, it was an international spectacle. At the last race in 1931, a million people came down to the shores of the Solent to watch the race happen. These machines, uh, like N248 and the Italian machines and the American machines that entered, were the fastest machines on Earth, and the pilots who flew them were the fastest men on Earth. When this competition started, the speeds were around about 40 miles an hour. By the time it finished, they were 400 miles an hour. England will talk to you on the design of Snyder Trophy seaplanes. In the design of a seaplane of this type, the one outstanding and all important requirement is speed. Every feature has to be sacrificed to this demand. It is not good enough to follow conventional methods of design. It is essential to break new ground and to invent and involve new methods and new ideas. There is the myth around Mitchell of being a genius who designed all these aircraft on his own with a little notebook and, and a pencil. In fact, there was an enormous design team at Supermarine. 
He had around him people who had superior knowledge on high-speed flight. And that was invaluable when they went back to the drawing board after the race in 1931 and started on the Spitfire. It wasn't just Britain making strides in aviation. In Germany, a new and increasingly sinister political force was using aircraft to spread its influence. These new developments became a powerful symbol of Nazi ambition. By 1933, this could no longer be ignored. For months now, some of us have been trying to impress on the government that the danger is growing, but this is a democratic country. The policy of the government is the will of the people, or it's supposed to be, and the passionate desire of every sane, thinking person is for peace. Well, Mitchell, what do you propose? I want to build a fighter, the fastest and deadliest fighting aeroplane in the world. It's got to do 400 miles an hour, turn on a sixpence, climb 10,000 feet in a few minutes, dive at 500 without the wings coming off, carry eight machine guns, As far as aeroplane design goes, everybody's looking for those few percent improvements. That slight edge in performance. Aerodynamics, engines, structures, this type of thing. This is the old 24-foot wind tunnel at Farnborough. It was used basically to uh, wind tunnel test full-scale aeroplanes. Various countries, particularly Germany, were heading towards uh, a war situation, were developing fast bombers, so fighters had to become faster as well. We were terribly behind. But there was this constant cross-fertilisation between what the Germans were doing and what we were doing here at Farnborough. And this is the key to the whole story of the, the Spitfire's wing. Beverly Shenstone was a young Canadian aeronautical engineering graduate who came over to Britain and then immediately got himself a job with Junkers in Germany to try and find out what the Germans were doing in, in this area. I think it has been suggested that he might have been a spy, but uh, I don't know about that side of things. <laughs> he met one of the great names in aerodynamics, Ludwig Prantl. And it turned out that in 1918, Prantl had published the description of all their work during the First World War, including the wing plan form shaped as an ellipse. But he didn't just draw a simple ellipse, he drew two halves of two ellipses, a bluntish ellipse here and a much deeper ellipse there. And that, I have to say, is not only like similar to, it's damn well geometrically identical to what emerged on the Spitfire. And I think that Shenstone picked up that idea and brought it back when he came to work with Supermarine in, what, 1933, and suggested it to Mitchell. So, basically, the Spitfire had a German wing. And I suspect that a lot of people had been too embarrassed to say anything about it. In the aircraft factories of Britain, our workmen are trained to build to the most severe standards of accuracy in the world. Every part has been tested and retested until human ingenuity can do no more.
There are over 11,000 parts in a Merlin engine. Over 140 separate machining operations are needed to produce the Merlin crankshaft. Women prove themselves to be particularly adept at this exacting work. At each station, a sub-assembly or component is added to the engine. At the end of the line, the completed engine is vetted by an inspector who notes the numbers of individual components and assigns a new number to the whole engine. From now on, it has an identity. On March the 5th, 1936, the new fighter's prototype was ready for testing. There is only one person alive today who remembers the Spitfire's first test flight. Well, I was four and a half. My father worked at Supermarine for R.J. Mitchell. So we grew up with the aeroplanes and the Spitfire, especially because father was looking after the development of that. One day, he said to mother, um, do you want to come and see the first flight of our new aeroplane? So we got in the back of the car and off we all went to Eastleigh. Pilot came out and got in, and then uh, off he went. type of single-seater fighter and as you can see a monoplane. In design and construction she is not unlike the last Snyder Trophy winner. We are flying along in our own plane at about 175. So what speed she is capable of you may judge from the pace at which she overtakes us. Father was very pleased that it had uh, taken off all right and flown and come back. Oh, that was all right, that was good or something. And uh, that was the first flight of the, the Spitfire. <laughs> Just two days later, on March the 7th, 1936, Hitler's troops marched into the Rhineland. It was an ominous moment for the future of Europe. We knew perfectly well it was coming. The rise of Hitler and all this business about occupying the Rhine was a time that we realized that there was a war on the way. Churchill had been warning us, kept warning us and warning us all the time about what was going to happen. But at that age, you don't worry about the future. I don't think I had any specific feelings. The average 18, 19 year old is not terribly interested in what's happening in the future. I felt I don't remember thinking, oh my goodness, you know, a war possibly coming. 
With the threat growing by the day and time running out, Britain needed the Spitfire. But in June 1937 came a terrible setback. Well, I suppose you know something of the trouble or you wouldn't have come to me. I had an idea of it, yes. I'm afraid you're a rather sick man, Mr. Mitchell. I had an idea of that, too. Well, he'd been ill for some time. We weren't aware of it being children, but obviously father would have been. Because we used to go to his house uh, at weekends if there was something that, information that father had that he had to discuss with him. And we just stopped doing that. <laughs> and father all dressed up in black one day and went off and that was it. It's very sad, obviously, for everybody, especially in the team, when the leader's gone. In its hour of greatest need, the country had lost its greatest aircraft designer at the age of 42. It was now a race against time to get the Spitfire finished. It would join Britain's other new fighter, the Hawker Hurricane. Both would prove vital in the coming conflict. A welcome sight is to be seen in the Vickers Works at Eastley, one of the factories where the production of Spitfires is rapidly going ahead. In the present state of Europe, it seems that the country couldn't possibly have too many of these fighters, which claim to be the fastest in the world. Their powerful engines are lined up ready for installation, and every operation of manufacture and assembly is carried out with that delicate precision for which British workmanship is famous. On completion, the machines are given a thorough tryout, and you'll no doubt be pleased to notice the rapidity of their climb and their handiness in the air. I reached the dizzy age of uh, 19, and uh, it was a time when everybody was uh, beginning to think of joining up. And uh, I uh, decided the best thing to do was to uh, join the RAFER, Volunteer Reserve. And uh, in due course, I did get called up for flying training. So my flying career started in the Tiger Moth. I wanted to fly, but it was an expensive business. So I thought, well, the cheapest way is join the Air Force. Then they probably pay you to learn to fly. I wrote off to Air Ministry saying that basically I was leaving school within a year and wanted to fly an aeroplane, and could they give me a job, really? In August 1938, the Spitfire entered RAF service. It was not a moment too soon. ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country 
is at war with Germany. Came over the radio that we were at war. Had an awful mug of wine each and wished each other good luck. And that was it. That was quite, it was quite emotional at the time. We discussed it with each other and, well, that's the sort of thing I think anyone would find a bit emotional if uh, you were suddenly told that war had already been declared. You knew you were in it, because after all, it was what you were being trained for. It was exciting, exciting. We wanted the war to start, you know. I wanted to be in it. I didn't want to be left behind. And don't forget, I was 18, 19. We were enthusiastic about everything in those days. What went through my mind was how long would it be before I got on a squadron? I went, first of all, I think it was just big and hill. And the CO looked at me and said, how many hours have you done on hurricanes, Pickering? I said, I've never even seen one, sir. So he said, well, there's one out there. Go and have a, go and have a look at it. Towards the end of my training, I think the war was getting a bit worrying to everybody and uh, I was taken out of, of practice camp and I ended up in the Spitfire squadron. When I first saw the Spitfire, you know, I thought, my gosh, this is quite something. The ground crew strapped me in and uh, it was all a bit intimidating, you know, There's even the start-up. <laughs> Smoke coming right back. I could see it now. I remember taxiing out, being very careful. itself in the air with me hanging onto the stick of a throttle, dragging me along with it, you know. In the spring of 1940, Hitler's attack in the West began. Europe crumbled. When France fell, the British army retreated to Dunkirk and by a miracle returned home. Now just one country remained in Hitler's sights. What General Wagon has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, 
ันเลตอัปแลนด์ The Germans were going to land with quarter of a million people on the south coast of Britain between Brighton and Dover. Had they landed, they would have won, without a doubt, and the course of world history would have been changed. We fully realised that we'd got to stop the Hun from getting over. We knew that we were an important line in the defence. The fighter pilots. If he ever landed and secured a foothold, we'd never get him out. There was never ever any thought of defeat. Never. We were cocky. We were bees and ease. After all, we got wonderful aircraft to fly. We were very fortunate, in spite of the treasury, that we had Spitfires and Hurricanes. German invasion to succeed, Hitler needed to destroy the Royal Air Force and its airfields, and secure mastery of the skies. The Luftwaffe had 2,600 aircraft. They outnumbered RAF Fighter Command by four to one. For most of the young pilots, it would be their first time in action. If they failed, the country would fall. Obviously, we were going to be involved in a pretty serious business. Being shot down didn't uh, appeal to me, so I thought, how do I avoid it? Make yourself a difficult target. How do you do that? Never fly straight and level for more than ten seconds. It's always the German you did not see that shot you down. My thoughts never went to what the future might hold, or whether we were going to get through it, or what was going to happen. After all, we were only about 19 or 20, 21 years old. So we were pretty young. We were all pals together. The camaraderie was great. We, were, we knew we depended upon each other. We knew that we were sure of getting uh, support wherever we were. I was sent to Uxbridge, which is 11 Group headquarters, into the operations room. I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I was a good plotter. I shouldn't say that, but but uh, that was why I was always on the southeast corner, which was the busy corner. Enemy aircraft was picked up on the radar. All that information was sent to Fight Command. They sorted it out and then sent the plots out to the groups. So he'd say scramble and they would have to get up in the air. As the plots kept coming through, we would put the arrows on the table so that the controller could see what was going on. The 
controller had the information and was able to pass it on to the pilot. And I remember climbing up, struggling for height, and looking up, and this woman out, one of 20 to 30 above my head. And there's this fascination of seeing the enemy close at hand. You see the black crosses and things on the aeroplanes, and you know that it's going to attack you in a moment or two. We have 15 seconds of ammunition. 300 rounds per gun. Our advice was to go in head on attack and go straight through. Don't hang around because their fighters would come and pick you off if they could. You went straight through them, fired your guns, closed your eyes and fired your guns. And then, provided you weren't hit by return fire, you were through the other side. In seconds. In seconds. Oh, got away with that. <laughs> yeah. We've got hollow lines, spitfires and hurricanes screaming round. You didn't know who was who half the time. We were up here in the spitfires. But you could see what the hurricanes were doing. I remember three hurricanes diving into 500 Heinkels and the Heinkels scattering. You see the enemy within feet of them, close enough to touch. I remember firing Patton aircraft directly in front of me. Two people bailed out so close that their parish was still undeveloped. And they came straight at me, and I thought they were going to hit me. There was this bang. I suddenly realized there was a 109 right behind me. He had his goggles down, and I, I could see his head. Oh, yeah, he was close. He, he was real close. And I looked up and I could see him looking at me. You learn the, the hard way. Once you saw flames, you didn't stop on board an aircraft. It could easily just blow like that. And it wouldn't give you a chance to get out. Release that pit and out you came like the cork out of a bottle. I remember landing my parachute in the guard's depot at Catrum. They took me to the colonel, who very quickly opened a bottle of whiskey <laughs> to have a sip. <laughs> I saw the stupors. Once they'd finished their dive, they didn't climb up again. They stayed low and headed out towards France. And uh, so it made it easy for us. In recent operations, RAF automatic cameras, taking film of the small home movie type, were attached to hurricanes and spitfires. Built for the job, the camera fits into the wing. It automatically takes pictures when the pilot fires his machine gun and stops when the gun stops. I attacked one of them, I think, and uh, it was shot down. And the other one went into the sea. You don't have any feelings about it. All you think about is trying to get a decent shot at it. I, I can't help it, but I, I did enjoy it. But, uh, and I, I think quite, I think probably quite right. It's from a human point of view, I suppose. You shouldn't say you enjoyed it when other people alongside you were being killed. Uh, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I, I, I probably did.
seems extraordinarily difficult to put a, an easy story on it. It really is. Um, certainly were times when one uh, was, was quite frightened of uh, what was going on. We uh, all three uh, got on his tail and uh, I can remember after firing at him, uh, he was just more or less coming along the water. And uh, although I didn't knock him into the sea, uh, the chap following me certainly got him and uh, he burst into flames and uh, went into the sea. We were told there were 109 over Broadstairs. And I happened to look down and I saw these two chaps right on the water going out from the coast. And uh, we quite clinically got behind them, right on the deck. They hadn't seen us. We shot them both down. Just a boom, boom. You've got to remember, we're talking about total war. And we were up against it because there was nobody else helping us. All the continent had fallen down and it was us against this monster. By the end of August 1940, the Luftwaffe's daily assaults on the airfields were stretching RAF resources to the limit. Pilots and ground crews were exhausted. We never thought you were going to be killed. And it's only in retrospect when you're lying in bed at night and the bed alongside you is suddenly empty. Uh, the fact that they were killed 20, 30, 40 miles away, means that you wiped them for your memory. You never got too close. You kept yourself at a certain distance, because inevitably you would lose friends. There's no doubt about it. The damage that was being done to the country was very worrying. I think one was conscious of that. I think in many ways it made one even more determined to stop the German invasion. On September the 7th, the Luftwaffe changed tactics. Hitler's new target was London, not the airfields. The Blitz would bring misery to Londoners but it bought valuable time for the RAF. At last, the pilots could rest. The runways could be repaired and aircraft could be serviced. But the day of reckoning was approaching. I can remember looking up at the sky and thinking, it's going to be a lovely day again, you know, oh, God. And I offered up a little prayer. It's going to be a very busy day, oh, Lord, and if I forget you, don't you forget me. Give me this day, please. Please, give me this day. According to the German plans, if things were going right for them, they would invade on the 15th of September. Der Tag, this is the day they were going to invade.
that was the day that Churchill came down, and that was, I was actually on duty that day. But we were not ever allowed to look, turn out around and look up there at all. You know, we always had to keep our heads down and look at that plot. In the plotting room, Churchill watched the enemy attacks building. He asked if fighter command had any reserves. The answer was none. 2,000 people were in action over Kent and Sussex. I flew four times that day. We were in a vast panorama of blue sky with the green contrasting fields of England below. And it was that that helped you. I can hear him to this day the controller coming up and saying, 150 plus approaching Dungeness. And Brian said, tell how I can see them. But I looked ahead and there was this great big cloud of gnats on a summer evening. 109's above Heinkel's and I thought, oh gosh. You know, where do we start on this lot? I kept a diary. I was not allowed to keep a diary. Um, I mean, it was a it was a court martial offence to keep a diary. We had an absolutely frantic watch. We were almost driven potty. <laughs> we were so busy. There were air raids all over the country. We hardly had any relief at all. Did our best to sleep, but in any case, it was rather fitful. On the 15th of September, enemy aircraft were falling like confetti all over the southern counties. We were cock a hoop. September the 15th marked the turning point of the battle. When it ended six weeks later, it would become the first defeat of Hitler's forces. The first victory in the fight for freedom. I think we realized that we were there, we got a job to do and we had to do it. And we did it, to the best of our ability. I always remember the elderly ladies in the east end of London and come putting their arms around you and giving you a kiss and saying, keep them away, boys, keep them away. It meant a lot to us, really, that. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen, who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many, to so few. The constant drone of machinery in our aircraft factories is the music of victory. Over acres of floor space, men and women are turning the money from the thousands of Spitfire funds into machines for the RAF. 
Despite heavy bombing, the two factories in Southampton and Birmingham continued to build Spitfires in large numbers. Women now played a key role in their manufacture and, as the Spitfire evolved, in their design. Women were also recruited to fly them from the factories to the airfields. These women are in the news at home because they've undertaken a somewhat unusual war job. All these women of the Air Transport Auxiliary are most experienced pilots, each with a record of about a thousand flying hours to her credit. 1941, I joined the Air Transport Auxiliary as a pilot. By carrying out this duty, they are relieving the pressure of work that would otherwise fall to RAF pilots. Oh, that was great. I was with uh, 16 other girls that had already joined. So that was wonderful. And at that time, I think I was one of the youngest ones, and so I uh, had to behave myself. <laughs> we were all very young. We weren't in the services, so we didn't have to have our hair cut. And we did look very glamorous with our gold wings and uh, gold badges of rank on the shoulder. Whenever you went into an RAF mess, you know, they were always anxious to talk to you. It was a very glamorous life, and it was very difficult not to be spoiled, I guess. Well, I, I did have lots of boyfriends. <laughs> it takes me back about 50 years, doesn't it? But to keep the Royal Air Force on the offensive, hundreds of aircraft must be flown each day between the factories, the maintenance depots, and the aerodromes. I saw these Spitfires. I hadn't seen a Spitfire before. I'm sure my heart was beating hundreds to the dozen. <laughs> when you actually told you're going to fly in the Spitfire, I suppose it's almost breathtaking. It's partly nervousness, will I do it properly, and partly elation that you have finally made it. I got in the aircraft and it Chappie said, how many of these have you flown this? And I said, I haven't flown one at all yet. This is the first one. And he <laughs> promptly went <gasps> and fell off the aeroplane. <laughs> so I was excited and I started the aeroplane, taxied out. Fortunately, it made a perfect takeoff. Up in the air, I thought, I'm here, I must do something. So I went round and round and up and down. It was so delightful. I've had a lovely time before I had to land it. I thought, oh my goodness. A test pilot once said that she was a lady in the air, but a bitch on the ground. Now, this was because she had a much narrower undercart than the Hurricane, so you had to be very careful in landing. It was quite often very dangerous. We had no radio at any time, no aids whatsoever. In between this, there was the hazards of the bad weather and the balloons which would pop up. And people did get killed. There were casualties and one heard of them all the time. But I think the thought of what was happening in the war as a whole was always in the back of our minds. There was always news coming through of either defeats or, or setbacks. 
And it was a nice feeling, however modest, that you were doing something to help the war. In 1941, with Britain beyond his reach, Hitler turned his attention to North Africa. The prize was control of the Mediterranean and the Arabian oil fields. As battle raged in the desert, his supply lines were under constant attack by British aircraft based on Malta. The tiny island was subjected to a massive bombing campaign. It had to be defended at all costs. With Spitfires being held back in Britain, Hurricanes were sent on aircraft carriers to do the job. The young pilots would face a new challenge, fraught with risk. None of us have taken off from a carrier or landed on a carrier. So the day arrived and we were going to fly off at dawn. Now, I hated flying off at dawn. I used to think, why in God's name we go, don't we take off at lunchtime after a good lunch? And then you always had to do it at dawn. So there I was, one of 23 aircraft lined up waiting to take off. We were being led by a fullman. Now, there's one thing that was worse than a hurricane, it was a full moon. It was a useless, useless aeroplane. And we were going to follow the full moon all the way to Malta. And everything was radio, silence. We weren't supposed to utter a word in case we gave the whereabouts to the fleet. And we did go for an hour. And suddenly, the full moon, which is leading us, had a, an engine problem, disappeared into the cloud. So I was left there. I didn't have any maps. I didn't know where Malta was. All I knew was surrounded by the enemy. And I was just 20 years of age. I didn't know what to do. And I flew around in circles with 11, 10 people following me around in circles. With them looking at me as a leader and me not knowing what to do. And I can tell you, I prayed, I prayed. I didn't know what to do, what to do. And God answered. But he doesn't answer you with a flash of lightning. He put something in your head that you've never thought of before. And I thought, what I'd better do now is fly all the way back to Gibraltar, which was 850 miles in the opposite direction. So I set off. By the grace of God, I came across the wake of the Navy and found the Ark Royal and all the fleet, 20, 25 ships. And I thought, what are they going to do with me? They're going to shoot at me and they think I'm the enemy. How do I let them know <laughs> that I'm a friend? So then they found another full They scrambled it. And uh, we began to follow it again, 20 feet above the waves. We'd been in the air several hours. We had no fuel. No fuel at all. And Walter suddenly appeared. And I remember going over the cliffs. And I was approaching Luca, and the airfield in front of me rose up. Bomb blasts. Freedom. All the time I've been looking down to see where I was going to land on the ground. I looked up 
and the air was filled with Germans, about 50 or 100. I said, sod it, I'll, no matter what I do, I'm going to land there. So I landed between all the bombers. And uh, two days later, we heard the air raid sirens going. And then at these three 109s appeared 20 feet above the ground, firing. And the bullets were going through the tent above my head. They wrote us all off before we'd even taken off. So we didn't have an airplane to fly. And suddenly, the Spitfires arrived in March 1942, by the grace of God. With the fate of Malta in the balance, the arrival of the Spitfires came just in time. And that's 124 Squadron, the first squadron that I joined. In those days, I was a sergeant pilot, and there I am, one, two in from the right there, a very young 18-year-old. Now, I was posted to Malta, the Eagle, uh, and that's the one we flew off. They took it to a thousand miles down the bed, and we had the rest to do. You just had enough fuel to make it comfortable to get into Malta. It was just a, a matter of getting in as well as you could, missing the potholes and getting to a pen. Within minutes, my Spitfire was being refueled by swarms of airmen passing petrol cans to one another to fill it up. Amazing. I mean, you only just arrived there and your Spit was ready to fly. Welcome to Malta. Our job was to get the bombers, not the fighters. We had to get as much height as we could because then you had advantage of coming down. We didn't aim to get into a dogfight with Messerschmitts because we were too short of the Spitfire to lose one. We hit the bomber. Made sure that he'd he clobbered him and then spiral down to the sea and try and escape. But Messerschmitt soon cottoned on to this and they followed down. So we ended up with a dogfight anyway at sea level, fighting for my life. When two of them attack you, you get your sights on more quickly and keep your eye on the other one coming down behind you. You get a quick squirt. And then always your eyes are flicking towards number two coming down. You've got to act with him. You've got to outfly him. You sweat profusely. And then you're not sweating because you're hot. You're sweating fear. And it trickles down your forehead and then through, from the eyes, it trickles down into the mouth and it's salty. That's fear. It's a, a salty taste. You always put these swash tickets in. That was the first one in Malta that I got. And that was the three in, in one fight, yeah. Well, I think a six of us claimed that one. Uh, it, it shows you the actual young Z-8 aren't down there, because the poor old pilot was there. You become an, a, an ace when you shot five or more aircraft down. And funny enough, it's rather strange that, that but I am the last surviving 
ace from Malta living today, her last one. Isn't it amazing? The Spitfires had done the job. By November 1942, the island was safe. The tide of the war was turning. The United States and the Soviet Union were now fighting on the Allied side. With the constant need for pilots, the RAF became a truly multinational fighting force. They came from all over the world and from the conquered countries of Europe. And they all wanted to fly Spitfires. I remember first flight from the Polish wing, three squadrons of Spitfires over France. The object was to throw the country, come and fight, and by gum they did. A lot of blood was spilled over France, ours and theirs. It, it was a hard fight all the time. We had Spitfire fives. And suddenly, a new enemy aircraft arrived on the scene, called a Focke-Wolf 190, and it made rings round us. They would come up above, they'd just dive straight down, beat somebody off, and we, we'd lost, or we, we lost several pilots. So that was a very happy time. <laughs> Very interesting indeed. Something we've been wanting to examine for some time, the Fokker Wolf 190. The RAF forced it down on the south coast of England, where an armed patrol promptly grabbed the pilot before he could do any damage. Now it's in the RAF. The 190 was a very potent aeroplane, so we had to respond. The Spitfire loaned itself to development, and almost overnight, Rolls-Royce took the engine out, stuck a great big blower on the back of it, and it was a difference in performance for Federal. Spitfire 9 was a really very, very good machine. It got a lot of power, and that's what was needed. to a height of about 10,000 feet, you suddenly whoosh, and a supercharger came in, which gave us an extra bit of life to go higher. And uh, after that, the FW-190s, there were no fear for us. Any time we met them, we got the better of it. Spitfire had helped to secure aerial supremacy. The liberation of Europe could now begin. And 1944, we were stationed down at Bogdor Regis for the forthcoming invasion. We saw them painting black and white strips under the wings of our planes for identification. We, we knew what that must mean, but we still didn't know where or when we were going. And uh, on the evening of the 5th of June, uh, we were all called over to a briefing 
And uh, when we got into the tent there, we saw a big map of uh, Normandy. And that was our first knowledge that that was where it's going to be. And of course, this was June when dawn came early and we, we didn't get any sleep. But I, I do, do remember though, we were all sitting around in little groups talking because we knew that this was going to be the, the biggest day of our lives. Four years ago, Europe was Hitler's. The lights of freedom went out. Now the world of free men strikes in all its assembled might at the weakening chains of bondage. Here are the first pictures of the opening of the Second Front. Pictures which security demands should be meager at this stage. Yet thrilling because they carry the first flush of excitement as the mammoth task gets underway. Craft running up on the beaches, and uh, it was an absolute hell, you know. We were completely detached from it. On D Day, I went over there uh, uh, three times, and it was quiet all the time. You know? We never saw the German Air Force. Quite honestly, if they had turned up, they would have had a, a very, very hard time. But it's not only the Orias, but uh, all the American fighters were up there as well. Very, very successful, actually, because they, the whole of the northern France there was covered with, uh, with fighters. While civilian Britain sleeps, history's greatest story is being written. Between midnight and breakfast, the D-Day plan is launched. And when the news breaks, the people at home rush to buy it. Eagerly, they absorb every line of the rationed information as it comes to hand. The news is good, far better than they dared to hope. Bridgeheads are won. We penetrate inland. Airstrips are under construction. And best of all, casualties amazingly light. We used to escort bombers. And they were dropping bombs on woods, and we never knew why. We did know that the Germans had some sort of a secret weapon coming. Das ist V1 im Einsatz. Doodlebugs. They were pretty fast. They were over 400 miles an hour they traveled. I chased one once across the channel, and, but it, uh, it was too fast for me. The jet-propelled V-1 was taking warfare in a new and frightening direction. The country needed an answer. And once again, it was the Spitfire. Mark 14. She's slightly larger and even faster than her predecessors and was designed to meet the constant demand for more speed. The wings are clipped to give better maneuverability at low altitudes. A completely redesigned fin and rudder was essential but the Mark 14 had an even more powerful Rolls Griffin engine. To accommodate this new engine, the nose was lengthened again and a bigger spinner was needed. Spit 14 was the Griffin engine. There was no slouch. The acceleration was something like I'd never experienced before. That was a real Spitfire. The 
top fighter gets in a successful bust. The Spitfire was built as an interceptor fighter. Get up there, have a go, come down, refuel, that, that sort of thing. But it went on to be developed into 24 marks with a speed over the initial one of over 100 miles an hour, carrying twice or three times the, the weapon load. It was a design which was brilliant. By the end of the war, 1945, I flew pretty well all of them, all 24 marks. We used to appeal to Supermarine. We said, God say, try and design something else. You got to the stage where the engine was very powerful. The aircraft is turning round the propeller, round the propeller around the aircraft. They had two bladed propeller, three bladed, four bladed, five bladed, six bladed propeller. It had let outlived its life. Twenty two thousand Spitfires were built before the jet engine brought its life to an end. But 75 years after the end of the war, over 50 of these planes still fly. And more are being returned to the air every year. Well, it's an extraordinary thing about public opinion, isn't it? It does funny things. I mean, the Spitfire did fly all the way through the war. And uh, a lot of people like to see them nowadays. They're so precious. It brings back all sorts of memories. All sorts. I am amazed to this day of the uh, reputation that Spitfire has, and especially the pilots. Amazing how people have got onto this Spitfire business. The fact that people revel in the Spitfire and uh, the iconic feel it has, I can't really explain it. You know, there are some who would rather have a flight in a Spitfire than spend their pension money on a, a Jag or something, I think. That must tell you something. But the aura surrounding the Spitfire is more a post-war phenomenon than a wartime thing. Uh, it was just an instrument of war then. I don't know why. Human nature is such that we have to fight each other and destroy each other. 
Well, it was something which I was asked to do, and I did. But life's very strange. One gets one gets tested and checked and things like that. You got to try and live a life where you try and not upset other people. I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I don't know whether we should forget it. But we've got to always remember those who didn't come back. You've always got to remember them. At the time, one didn't think anything of it at all. I'm very proud to have taken part in it. And, um, I think all those who, are, who took part are. I think the chaps who are still alive, I think they they have a certain pride in it. There aren't many of us left alive, you know. They're not getting any younger. I suppose in all the five years, I doubt if there'll be any of us. It never goes away. It never goes away, this, this threat of warfare. The generation before us had been through a war. The generations after us have been through wars. In all conscience, the world needs a change from all this hostility and warfare. The world needs a change. It's not about medals. It's not about who shot down what. It's not about the thank yous. But it is nice to be remembered because being remembered covers everybody who served, flew and fought in the war. Uh, she is original, 98% of her, all the skin panels and all the inner parts, they are original 1944. The reason for it is that she never saw combat. She was actually delivered from the factory by Mary Ellis, who was one of these ATA girls, the Air Transport Auxiliaries. Mary Ellis was a, a slip of a girl, but I know that she flew 1,000 aircraft during the war, of which 400 were Spitfires. And for some reason, she decided on a whim to sign her name on this airplane in 1944, which was then Mary, Mary Wilkins. And you can still see the signature, very faded, Mary Wilkins ATA for Air Transport Auxiliary. But the most wonderful thing is that she is still alive and she's going to be 100 in two or three months' time. This wonderful Spitfire that I flew in 1944 on a delivery flight from the factory is coming in this afternoon. I can't wait. <laughs>
It seems so small now, doesn't it? <laughs> Spitfire. Fantastic. <laughs> Dear oh, Mary. So great. Great. <laughs> so great to so go. good to see you. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Always excited about this one? Yes, yes. of course. I, I flew about a thousand aeroplanes during the war. Yes. That's the only one I've signed. That's the only magical. One. It's fabulous. And what came over you that you decided to to sign this one? I suppose it was a romantic mood. Just <laughs> <laughs> thinking some handsome RAF chap might be fighting, you know, and suddenly see my name and yes. contact me. And look you up. It never happened. It never happened. No, it's until now. <laughs> Don't tell your wife I said that. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> this is between us and all the cameras. Yes. yes. Would you mind um, <laughs> stepping inside again and sign the airplane again for this day? Is that all right? That's right. Thank you for allowing me to uh, write on your airplane. <laughs> Delighted and honored. When I was a child, I read about Spitfires and the Battle of Britain. This airplane stands for so much grace and gallantry. It's a symbol of freedom. Here he comes. Here he is.